Over the last 50 years, you have held several prestigious academic positions in departments of mathematics, philosophy, psychology, the history and philosophy of science, law, evaluation, and also education. Your extensive publishing career includes, to date, more than 450 publications in the fields of your appointments, as well as in computer science, informal logic, cosmology, international philanthropy, and technology studies. You have also served on the editorial and advisory boards of more than 40 scholarly journals and were elected president of both the American Educational Research Association and the American Evaluation Association. Your past recreational efforts include rowing from Melbourne University and Oxford, membership in the Frisbee Hall of Fame, and sports car racing, although recently the emphasis has been more on bird watching, technology studies, and knife collecting. What else would you like to accomplish that you have not done yet? Oh, crack the ethics problem. I mean, that's the really important thing. Um, what else besides that? I have done a fair bit of house designing. Um, I designed and built a, a few houses, three really. And uh, I would like to find time to do a bit more of that, particularly to improve the, the building costs of very low cost houses, where I think, uh, which I've studied fairly carefully, and where I think we really still could do quite a lot to bring home ownership into the pockets of people in the lower middle class in a way we haven't done yet. Uh, so there's quite a few things. Actually, lots more. If I sat down and thought, I could make a list of 20. So I've still got lots of things to do. You still have a to-do list that's yes. quite long and extensive. Yes. And yes. varied. <laughs> yeah, and varied, yes. What impact has your research had of which you are most proud? Well, I think I might have had something to do with improving the logic of evaluation. And if that's true, um, then that would be what I'm most proud of. Um, I think another thing, though, that when I get into these sessions, I feel it's really important to stress is that when I was a beginner at, in the academic game around 1952, 51, 52, I was writing quite a lot and publishing a little bit. And people would say to me, um, you know, if you could just focus on one area, I think you might be able to do something really important. And my response to that was, I'll focus on what I damn well want to focus <laughs> on. And if it's many areas, well, that's OK with me. So you get used to it. Um, and so I did make a real effort to do something worthwhile in a number of areas, partly in order to show it can still be done. You know, the, the general picture people have is you have to specialize because there's so much to cover, you can't cover more than one area. Well, I agree. I mean, you, you don't absolutely cover one area. Nobody does. Um, but forget that. It's a silly ideal. Do what you can that's worth doing is what you ought to be focusing on. And if that takes you to a lot of areas, good luck to you. But we ought to have more people saying, I don't believe that stuff about specialization is necessary for achievement, significant mm -hmm. achievement. Mm -hmm. You can specialize or not. There are a lot of ways to do a lot of different things. And you ought to try for it if you are interested in a lot of different things. It will make you a more interesting people for other people to talk to, <laughs> and that's of some consideration too. <laughs> of what in your personal life are you most proud? Ah, uh, well, personal life, I mean, I flunked it all the time. I mean, I wasn't a very good boy, um, and I wasn't very good for years after that. I didn't treat people as well as I should have. And, you know, I mean, I'm prepared to blame the fact that nobody had a reasonable system of ethics um, <laughs> around at the time. But 
and I was smart enough to see the loopholes in all of them, but um, I wasn't flouting what looked like a defensible system of ethics, but I was flouting what seems to be a common principle in nearly all of the systems, namely altruism. And I shouldn't have been doing that because I knew damn well that would be in whatever system got to rise to the top. So it wasn't uh, excusable. So I've always thought that that was a serious failing. And you, in that area, I really don't have much to claim in the way of achievements, except recognizing that this needs work. <laughs> sure. What impact would you like your research still to have? Uh, yes. Now, what I here are just two things. I want the curriculum of the public school in every country to include serious teaching of critical thinking, practical applied logic. Um, we don't do that yet. Mm. Some countries do it pretty well. UK is an example, but most countries don't do it. And in this country, we have laws in Texas that are aimed to make it impossible to teach critical thinking or thinking that will lead you to criticize your parents uh, in the schools. The exact opposite of what's needed. Mm -hmm. What you need is parents who are uh, worth being examples of. Uh, then we begin to get the adherence to the family values. Okay, so I want to see critical thinking seriously taught, not what's called critical thinking by sloppy thinkers, mm. which is often taught. And secondly, exactly the same for ethics. I need to see ethics as a serious subject in the curriculum, taught seriously and dealing with current problems as part of the preparation for life and I need it to be justified in some way that does not violate church and state distinctions. So if I could see any progress whatsoever towards those two things, I'd feel this is a great achievement. Wonderful. Now we're on to a section, the final section of the interview called introspective questions. Who do you believe has had the greatest impact on you and the person and scholar you are today? It's very hard to say. I, but the headmaster, the principal of the school that I went to uh, in Australia when I was a kid was enormously influential. When I was 15, 14 or 15, I ran away from home and never went back. And I ran away to school. Um, that is, I got the uh, principal to accept me back as a student without the permission of my mm. mother. My father was then dead. Um, and that was made possible, Mike, finishing off the next four years of really hard work at school, mm. three years, and then going on to the university uh, and everything else. So that was somebody who made a great difference. Um, he was uh, the most famous headmaster in uh, Australia, J James Ralph Darling. And, uh, but there were people like Kurt Beyer, my friend at the university, mm -hmm. who had a similar type of influence. And there were people I never met, like uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein, who inspired me, my philosophical training and practice for the, for the rest of my life. Um, so these were great influences. Um, of course, many other friends without whom I couldn't have made progress at all in doing things I really wanted to do, like working in education. I could never have done that unless the people in education had been willing to greet colleagues from across the disciplinary borders, which they were, and that was a great value to me and a great credit to them. It's something that the people in the social sciences are not um, universally re recognized for doing. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was very grateful for that. Uh, yeah. Okay. What inspires you? 
oh, what inspires me? Uh, people who transcend the stereotypes in which they're brought up, um, great businessmen who transcend the businessmen stereotypes, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and so on, who, people who say um, tax the rich more and who say, how can I give away in a way that will help people the most? These are the people that inspire me. Mm -hmm. And people who commit their life to giving service to others at a humbler level, but uh, manage to help many, many people, even in the, the health relationship care of caregiver, but in the teaching relationship. I mean, the bottom line is that a teacher has a thousand students or more in a lifetime of teaching. And in the case of somebody like me who extends the boundary of that lifetime, I bet you can get it up to more like 10,000 if you push things a bit. That's a lot of influence. Mm. Now, every one of them that makes it into a labor of love and detailed care and improvement is having an enormous influence, maybe changing the world. So that influence is something we need to keep in mind when we deal with or fire or hire teachers or uh, are in other ways indebted to them. And we should keep it in mind all the time. What do you find uninspiring? Well, principally people who um, got lucky in the market and regard this as a sign of their great wisdom. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's such a piece of bad inference that it's hard to believe. And of course, the evidence nearly always proves otherwise. Um, but uninspiring, I think people who really seriously blame um, something else besides their own self for the bad choices they made or didn't make. Mm. Um, that's just a, I mean, Aristotle made the point against that very well. I don't often quote Aristotle, but what he said was, you choose your friends. That means you choose your character. So don't blame it on the character you inherited from childhood. It's your character. You own it and you made it what it is with the help of your friends. What is your favorite word? Oh, anti-disestablishmentarianism. Okay, right well, off the cuff. Lo longest word in the English language. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Uh, we don't print those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? Uh, the, the easy one for me would have been architecture because I had the, the math, the science, and the appreciation of technology. Um, and if you were asking me the question, what am I going to do next, apart from the mainstream, on, which is on evaluation, the second string, a book I've had a contract for for 20 years, is on the nature of technology, which is completely misunderstood. The Oxford American Dictionary defines it as applied science, a sign of the absurdity of our thinking about technology. Since we all know that technology existed at least hundreds of thousands of years ago, because we have the artifact, but and science certainly did not exist before 5,000 years ago, mm. so it's obviously impossible mm. for one to pursue the, the other for, for science to be the ancestor of the other. Mm. Um, so I want to straighten that out, and in doing so, um, the book contract is for a book called The Logic and Love of Technology because people forget that uh, technology carries on its back huge branches of art, huge branches of behavioral training, uh, and many other things that are really important in our lives, and not to mention our habitat, food, and all our tools. So uh, we sort of underestimate it. We don't have a single course on the nature of technology uh, in, the, in the K-12 
curriculum as part of the core curriculum. Um, not even there at all. It, in the UK, it's part of the, the public curriculum. Um, it's a fatal mistake for a country which is built on its success in technology um, to ignore it like that and make all the mistakes that follow from that. We failed badly and repeatedly in harnessing technology within education because we, the bank has had no idea of what it takes to fund an application of technology. And they thought, you know, once you've got a computer that could learn something, uh, then why, why couldn't it teach it to somebody else? So they would back prematurely and then be disappointed in what they got because they don't have the faintest appreciation for what technology is. I mean, they get lucky every now and again, of course. They back a winner, but more often they back lo losers. So this is all something else I, I forgot to mention when you <laughs> asked me about what... So I, I want to do quite a lot of things. So let's see if I can get a year or two out of the future. <laughs> what profession other than yours would you not have liked to attempt? Not have liked. Uh, the study of ancient languages. Of ancient languages? Yeah. Very limited payoff for humankind. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite book? Uh, Philosophical Investigations by... Ludwig Wittgenstein. Mm. One of your heroes. If you could tell President Obama one thing, what would it be? Uh, that's a very worthy question. I think it would be to figure that we're at the point where he should forget about getting the best things done and just make sure that he gets a lot of good things done however he can do them by the time he leaves the White House. He's, you know, he's sacrificed his own ideals in order to compromise. It hasn't worked mm. and so it's time to use executive powers. Mm. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, <laughs> why didn't you get here earlier? <laughs> Finally, in 1976, you wrote a practical guide for college students titled Reasoning, which was intended to improve students' skills in analyzing and evaluating, as well as presenting arguments, their critical instincts, and their knowledge about the facts and arguments relevant to contemporary issues in politics, education, ethics, and other fields. Now, 35 years later, what advice might you offer to graduate students who are also beginning researchers and evaluators who also hope to make a contribution like you to educational evaluation? I think the first thing is to ask yourself, what other non-evaluation interests do I have and believe that, that will stay with me for most of my life? Now I've got to marry the two. Um, I've got to find an area uh, in which I'm really interested where the contribution of evaluation has not so far been outstanding and then that's it, you're going to go for that area. Specialize in evaluation in that and start publishing and contributing in that area. I mean, that's the, you, I, I say to my PhD students who want something, mm -hmm. and I say, forget getting an easy PhD. You, it's going to cost you three years of hard work. Don't put in three years of hard work if it isn't in an area you really love because you won't make it or you won't make it as good as it could be. Find an area you love and do this and come back to me. What are some of the holes that need to be filled in terms of evaluation? You, you mentioned the peer review piece, which is a significant one, but what else? 95% of the places. I mean, I have a list of 40 subdivisions of evaluation mm. that have some fiddling around going on or full-fledged. 
I mean, they range from the portfolio software that the heads mm. of the big investment funds use to keep changing their investment portfolio, um, all the way down to the ordinary interactions of a teacher or a parent with a little one. And the evaluation side of that, which really is badly done still, uh, can't be, you can't say you need a PhD in child psych to do that. You've got to get some middle road where you have a list of things to do and not do, like, you know, try not to hit him so hard that it breaks bones um, and so on. Um, and make sure that they've been evaluated before you publish them. Mm -hmm. I mean, everywhere needs tons of work. Tons of work. I mean, supposing you're interested in math. Well, let's have a look at the foundations of math. Mm -hmm. and, or let's look at evaluation um, as it's used in giving money for math research. Mm -hmm. um, you, you pick an area, I'll point, to you, point you to places within that area where real massive pay, payoff could be f achieved by serious evaluation. Investigation. Work. Yeah. Your friend and colleague, Dr. Stuart Donaldson, describes your distinguished contribution to research and scholarship as follows. It's rather difficult to think about the world of evaluation without Dr. Michael Scriven's influence. Through his dedication and hard work, he has given us a philosophical grounding in the logic of evaluation, continuously pushed our thinking about unintended consequences of programs and interventions, offered us a goal-free evaluation approach, pioneered the ideas of formative and summative evaluation, helped us think about evaluation as a transdiscipline, developed a series of valuable evaluation checklists to help practitioners do their work, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. On behalf of all of us, educators, scholars, future educationists, educational researchers, educational evaluators, evaluators as a whole, we thank you, Dr. Michael Scriven, for everything you do and for most importantly being you. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor interviewing you today. It's a pleasure and thanks very much for doing it.